Commercial Space and Economic Feasibility is the title of the first panel this afternoon. And we're pleased to introduce three accomplished professionals who will uh, testify before us. Marco uh, Caceres is a senior analyst and director <laughs> of space studies for the Teal Group. He has edited the Defense and Aerospace Company's briefing service and is now lead analyst on the World Space Systems Briefing, which he created in 1992. Regularly cited by the trade and popular press for his space market forecast, Mr. Caceres has written for numerous space publications and is a frequent speak speaker at industry conferences. I'm a, a space market analyst, and my job is essentially to look at hundreds of proposed programs, space programs, and um, try to, to get a feel as to which ones are real and which ones are make-believe. Uh, then I come back to uh, my clients, which include NASA, Lockheed, Boeing, and some uh, very small companies like Kistler Aerospace, and I, I give them my opinions of, of what I think. Um, now, honestly, when I first heard of the President's Initiative, uh, I, I was a bit skeptical, and I continue to be a little bit of a skeptic, but I am very open to being convinced otherwise. On January 14th, when President Bush revived his father's 1989 plan, to establish a base on the moon and then proceed with manned exploration of Mars, our first inclination was to dismiss it as an election year publicity stunt. There was nothing in the initial outline of the program that led us to believe that this was a serious proposal. There was no mention of its estimated costs or how we intend to fund it. Given that the price tag for the effort will almost certainly start in the hundreds of billions of dollars we could accept the lack of immediate budgetary information from the Bush administration. After all, there is no use in scaring U.S. taxpayers until you've at least had a chance to sell them on the benefits of the program. Even though we suspect that the Moon-Mars combo does not approach being affordable, it is the nature of space market analysts like myself to give the benefit of the doubt to new space programs. We want new satellites and rockets to be launched. We hope for the development of new applications for space-based technologies. We wish to see more private investment in space ventures. We long for more government dollars to flow into NASA's R&D and procurement accounts. We are completely open to being influenced, even manipulated, by our industry to think that anything is possible. We possess an innate desire for our market to grow, our industry to create thousands of new jobs, and our companies to make lots of money. Thus, whenever a company or an agency announces that they will undertake to build a new satellite or launch vehicle, regardless of how much of a long shot the program may be, we will include it in our calculations of what we believe will happen in the future. In most cases, we eliminate programs from our forecasts because they're inadequately funded or because they appear to be overly ambitious from a technological standpoint. Often, we drop programs due to sparse information about the originator or the proposed system itself. Sometimes, we fail to include programs because they just don't sound right, as was the case when we first read in 1993 of Craig McCaw's 924 satellite LEO teledesic constellation. Teledesic definitely seemed like a pipe dream. A six billion dollar commercial broadband system? Hardly anyone had even heard of the word broadband back then. And the 73 satellite Iridium program, which had been made public only three years earlier, was considered to be an enormous undertaking at one billion dollars. Eventually, Iridium was a, a five billion plus dollar program. Yet even with a system the size and complexity of Teledesic, the temptation within the industry was to be cautiously optimistic that it would be built and launched, given that its initial investors included mobile telecom pioneer Macaw, Bill Gates, and Saudi Arabia's Prince Al-Walid. Almost everyone wanted to believe in the program, although few openly voiced much confidence in it for fear of being seen as too naive. The general consensus in the industry, in our industry, was let's see how Iridium goes before we get overly excited about Teledesic. 
We continued to closely track Teledesic throughout the mid to late 1990s. And eventually, when we got, we'd gotten a little more used to the concept, and the architecture had been downsized to closer to 300 satellites, not 900 plus, we began to include the system in our forecasts. The selection of Boeing as Teledesic's prime contractor in 1997, and Boeing's commitment to invest $100 million were other factors that influenced us. Ultimately, Teledesic went nowhere. After a decade and hundreds of millions of dollars invested in satellite design and development, McCall finally pulled the plug on the program in 2002. But the fact of the matter is that even though we did not include Teledesic in our forecasts early on, we took the program seriously from the beginning, primarily because we could at least see, foresee the day when it might be completed. The program was officially never more than five to six years away from launching its first batch of satellites. According to Teledesic's filing for orbital slots with the International Telecommunications Union in Geneva in 1995, the constellation was to be operational by 2004, with satellite launches expected to commence 2000-2001. The first launch timeline of five to six years was fairly common for other large commercial satellite programs of the 1990s, like Motorola's Iridium and Laurel's Global Star. The proposed first launch.